All right, let's pray. Father God, once again, we come before you. We ask that you speak into our lives this morning, Father. Help us to understand the very thing the apostles heard throughout all of Jesus' teachings, but especially this one of going into the world and making disciples. Father, it's my heart's desire that over the course of the next few weeks, that the excuses, the reasons for not living this out, that those are removed. Father, I pray for heavy conviction upon this congregation. God, to either be a disciple of you and of someone helping us to become like you, or, Father, for someone to commit to making disciples to help others to become like you. So let us hear from your word today those men and women heard on that mountainside help us to understand we love you we ask these things in your son's name amen all right so we are in week two of this go series right uh, jesus commanded his followers to go to all people groups and to make disciples so we'll, we're going to look at the acts version of this next week but he's very specific it, it's it's here at home to the ends of the earth, all right? Uh, I, I feel that LifeBridge is living this out. Uh, we've been on a, a several year, a 10, 11 year journey with our friends over in Zimbabwe. They have become family to us. Uh, we've gone over there, we've built relationships, we've done all this stuff to meet needs for the sake of now we can enter into this relationship with them. And it's not just about here, let's meet some needs, but here, Let's make disciples to the ends of the earth. As a matter of fact, that is what the trip next Monday is all about. We're going to sit down with five men, and this is all we're going to talk about and look into God's word is how do we do this? How does LifeBridge do this in Mashoko? How do you ministers in Mashoko and the surrounding regions, how do you do this with the flocks that God has given you? That's the command. Go into the world and do this. Last week, we defined what a disciple is. A disciple is a person who follows Jesus, who is formed by Jesus, and seeks to fulfill the mission of Jesus. I think it's coming up. Maybe not. Okay. But here's the thing. Here's the reality. Just because we know what something is, just because we know, okay, a disciple is this thing right here, doesn't mean we know how to make one, right? Like, like we know what turducken is. We, we, Duck Dynasty related us to that. They introduced us to that, and we know what this is, where, where you, you take a whole turkey and you shove a duck in it, and you shove a chicken in that, and then you roast the thing and you cook it. We know what that is, but how many of you know how to make one? No, we don't have to do that. So just because we know what a disciple is does not necessarily mean we know how to make one. So we study how Jesus did the things he did. His method is critical to you and I if we are going to grow and mature in our faith. 2,000 plus years later, we have this command, go make disciples. We live in a culture, however, that is very much removed from its original context. And so I get it. There's hesitation to live in this out. It's only natural. I mean, if, if you have grown up in church, I told you, man, I, I, I've grown up since second grade. I've been part of the independent Christian church. Wonderful congregations that Amanda and I have been part of as we've been married. Discipleship was not a thing. Church programming and participation off the chart. Perfect attendance in Sunday school, Jackie Hall, off the chart. That's the emphasis. But is that the very thing that Jesus was talking about when he said, go 
make disciples. And so, no, we, we don't hear and talk about, we don't understand this. We haven't been part of this culture. And so it's only natural for you and I to have some, some hesitation about this. It's, it's only natural that, that we come up with some excuses. And so we've said, hey, there's basically three primary barriers for not living this out. The first barrier is simply this. Ignorance. Hey, I, I don't understand what it means this day and age. I, I, I don't get it. Like, I'm supposed to just bring people to church and then the ministers and the staff and the people, y'all are the ones that are supposed to train these people up. I don't understand what this discipleship thing is that you keep talking about. That's okay. We call this the head. The understanding. The, the second barrier is I just don't have the proper motivation. I just don't have the same conviction that you do. We call this the heart. Hey, I understand, Michael, that you teach on this, and I understand that it's in the Bible, and I understand I'm supposed to do it, but you know what? I just, uh, whatever. I just don't have the proper motivation. There's a reason we should be motivated. You and I should be wanting to live this out. We'll get to that next week. We call that the heart. And then the third barrier is apathy. I don't care to live this out. I, I, I see it in the Bible. And I, I see how you're explaining it through Scripture. Doesn't mean it's for me, though. Doesn't have anything to do with my salvation. Call us the hands. So there's three barriers that we talk about in this disciple-making movement. Head, heart, hands. And so through the course of the next couple of weeks, this is what we are going to do. We're going to talk about these barriers. We're going to talk about these excuses. And we want to eliminate the barriers in your life. And, and then coming back in March, we want to give you the confidence to start living this out. But be warned. You do not have any excuses. Like, like you cannot sit there and say, well, well, Jesus, I just didn't know what it was about. I didn't make the effort because I, 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 I didn't understand or I didn't care. I thought it meant something else. Be warned. We're, we're eliminating the excuses for you not doing this on a personal level. So, today, let's understand this command. Let's understand it on a head level. Okay? Let, let, let's wrap our minds around what Jesus is saying when he says, go and make disciples, right? Uh, what does it mean to follow Jesus? Because this is where the journey begins. In the biblical example, when Jesus gave the invite, was pretty cut and dry, wasn't it? When it was time for him to go into the ministry... He went and he was baptized. John baptized him. He went out to the wilderness for 40 days where he was tempted. When he came back from that, after, after, the, after the testing was over, when he came back from that, he's walking along the, the, the shore of Galilee and he's preaching this message. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Repent. And so these fishermen, they're going out every day, doing their job, coming back, and they see this guy, this teacher, preaching the same message over and over again. And the crowd start to get a little bit bigger, and get a little bit bigger, and get a little bit bigger. Until one day, Peter and Andrew, James and John, they're all there together. And, and this teacher says, hey, Peter and Andrew, let me get in your boat and let's push out so I can teach. So they do. And when Jesus gets done teaching, there's this miracle of fish. And then he says this to those men. Follow me. And I will make you fishers of men. You know what they did? They said, okay. There was this literal invite. I, Jesus said to them, I'm going over here. I'm going on this journey. I want you to come, but you cannot hold on to the things right here. 
And, and so they, they left their business. They left their family. There's a dad right there. Peter has a wife. We'll talk about that later. They left family. They left their net so that they could go and follow Jesus. You know, we live in a world where it's easy to follow, isn't it? I mean, we, we live in a world where it's, it's easy to follow or to keep track of all types of people and organizations. You keep track of your sports teams. You can keep tra track of businesses. If you are on social media, which, which is most people in our culture, if you are on social media, you know, you've got the Snapchats and the Instagrams and the, the Twitters or the Xs or whatever else there is then your entire involvement around those platforms is all about follows. That's what it is. Your, your entire involvement, if you're on TikTok, you, you've got people that you follow. Otherwise, why are you on TikTok? You're trying to receive this content from these things. And, and here's the thing, when it comes to social media, we follow people who are in one of three categories. We follow friends and family. It's a great thing. This is so we can stay connected to our loved ones. It's, it's awesome that we can do stuff in Alabama and the grandparents in Georgia can see it. We follow, not we, but you people. <laughs> Y'all follow some people that you just want to be nosy about. You, you just want to spy on them. It's people that, hey, you want to be able to keep tabs on what's going on in their life, but you really don't want to be involved in their lives. And so they're just kind of like they're friends on, on your whatever your platform is, but, but you just do it for the sole purpose of let me keep in tabs. Let me keep tabs on, see what they're doing. Why'd they buy that thing? Where are they going on this vacation? You know they can't afford that vacation. What makes sense? You know, and that's what, that's what we, that's the second group of people that y'all follow. The third, and I've learned about this one. The third category is we follow influencers. Now, to, to, to the 50 and older crowd, let me explain what this is. Okay. <laughs> All right. On social media, some of y'all are looking at me like, what? Come on, influencers. Um, on social media, there, there are these people out there that they are known as influencers for whatever. If they're selling a product, if they're selling a clothing line, if they're, it, 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 it's, it's today's version of getting a, a, uh, a famous person to do a commercial to sell your product. That's, that, that's, that's what it is. All right. And so you've got these influencers. Uh, these are, get this, the trendsetters. I looked this up. The trendsetters of the internet. Regularly producing and sharing content that demonstrates their expertise, promotes a certain lifestyle, or simply motivates and inspires others. Whether they're focused on fashion, beauty, fitness, or anything in between, influencers use their creativity and charisma to inspire and entertain their audiences, making them a powerful force in the digital world. That's what an influencer is. And people flock to these people, whatever it is, whatever, whatever you're looking for. You're on social media, whatever you want, whatever platform you're on, and you're looking for, oh, look at this. I'm into fitness, and so you find this thing, and you track this person, and you follow this person, and now this, every time this person who's in the industry that you, you're familiar with, that, man, whenever they post something, it comes to you. And you just cross the board for anything. From anything. Amanda follows many people, okay? Um... But I think her favorite, I asked her, her favorite is this family out of the Dallas area, and it's got a turtle and a creek and a something, I can't remember. But she follows these people. And somehow this family has just become independently wealthy. Like, I, is that even known? Like, they're just rich. Okay, he, so he has a bit. They're, they're independently wealthy. How do we know this? Because they have multiple homes. 
They've got one home that's on some ski slope in Aspen where, you know, one of those, you walk out the door and you're on the slope and you get to do the thing. And they got a big house in Dallas and they travel all over the world on these elaborate vacations. And the mom is into all kinds of decorating. And, and, and so she's got this stuff that she pushes. And, and now guess what? The Sykeses are trying some of this stuff in their house. And they make all these <laughs> posts all the time about what's going on in their life. And they advertise the products they use. They influence others. Just one click. One click of a button. And I can follow anybody that's out there. One click of a button. And I can follow that person. Then I can check in on my follows. I could check in on all the Auburn Sports Radio Network and all the Auburn coaches and all the Auburn this. I could check in on this stuff whenever and how I want to. We follow all the time. But when it comes to Jesus, I'm thinking it's more than just the click of a button. I think when it, when it comes to Jesus, it's more than just previewing a screen to see what he is doing today. When it comes to following Jesus, it's more, church, than participating in a couple of services with some other people each month. When it comes to following Jesus, it's more than participating in some church activities. You gotta remember, and if you don't hear anything else today, please, please hear this. Our culture must not attempt to shape the body. That's a secular worldview. The Bible must always shape our lives within our culture. That's a biblical worldview. I'll show this to you in just a second. Paul wrote to the church at Rome, do not conform to the pattern of this world. There's a couple of Bible verses that weigh heavy on my heart. That one where Jesus says, get away from me because I didn't know you. But Lord, we were doing things in your name. Lord, we were prophesying and we were healing in your name. And he says, I don't know you. It's only those who do the will of my Father. That, those Bible verses, verses like that. The, you know, hey, we got all these people up here that are healing and prophesying in the name of Jesus. And he's like, I don't know who you are. What are you talking about? Get away from me. Those verses, but where Paul says, do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I look at my life and I'm like, man, there's a, there, that looks like a world. It looks just like the world over here. Those Bible verses scare me. We follow Jesus the same way the apostles did. It's not the click of a button. It's not participating in some activities. What did the apostles do? They surrendered their lives to him. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but shall have eternal life. We've covered this before, but it's worth repeating again. The word believes here is more than this knowledge of Jesus. James tells us, hey, that even the demons believe in him. Okay, they have a knowledge of him, but they're scared. They shudder. And they certainly are not getting a heavenly eternal life. The reality is we can be a wretched person. You can have knowledge of the gospel knowing that Jesus lived, died, and resurrected, and you can still not be a follower. You can be a believer of on a head knowledge level. That's not what the word believe here means. The word believe is this all-in action required. The Greek word pistuo, to have complete confidence in. 
And here's the thing, none of what we're talking about in this disciple-making movement, as we encourage you to make disciples and live this out, none of what we are talking about happens if we do not have belief, complete confidence in it. I have complete confidence in the things that Jesus says. I have complete confidence that he is who he is and that his promises are true to my life. The believing mentioned here is one that moves us from a knowledge of something to this complete confidence in something. Something that moves us from sitting here to becoming a follower of. My way of life, he says, is better. Come and learn from me. Do we really believe that? Do we really have complete confidence in what he says? We're to have this all-in belief of who he is. And here's the thing. It's not just a one-time deal. It's a choice that has to be made daily. Matthew 16, Jesus is talking to the disciples. Verse 24 says, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in His Father's glory with the angels, and then He will reward each person according to what they have done. Jesus would have made a terrible social media influencer. <laughs> hey, y'all just pick up your cross and follow me. Come on, that's all you got to do. Just follow Jesus. To wrap our minds around this, is to deny myself. Not just when it's easy. Not just when I'm forced into it. But I am to deny myself daily. I don't do what I say. How do you feel about verse 27? For the Son of Man is going to come in His Father's glory with His angels, and then He will reward each person according to what they have done. Second guessing, maybe. Hopefully you're processing, man, how, how, how much am I living for me? Remember, following a rabbi had one primary purpose, and that is to carry on his legacy. That, that's why I would follow the rabbi. It was a great honor to have this teacher who would invest in me, and in return, I would carry on that rabbi's legacy with every breath, and then I, would too, would have people who I would select, and they would follow me to carry on his legacy and now my legacy. That's the process of repeating over and over and over again. And I follow my rabbi, that's the commitment, I follow my rabbi every day so that I can become just like my rabbi. Does your life reflect the culture around you more? Or does your life reflect denying self and following Jesus? today in all his father's glory what kind of reward what kind of reward are you getting for the things that you've done I'm not questioning salvation here I'm not saying that oh no you didn't make a disciple so you're just not saved I'm, I'm not questioning that but if we're to deny ourselves and follow him so that we can become like him, then we're going to do the things that he did, and he's going to reward the people who do it. What kind of reward are you receiving? John summed it up this way in 1 John chapter 2. We know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. <laughs> 
Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar, and the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. Wow. It's not good enough to claim to know Jesus and then purposely not keep his commands. So it doesn't work that way according to this. Or I don't claim to know Jesus and then pick and choose when and how I will obey the commands. And we do a lot of picking and choosing in this, in this culture. You and I have a responsibility, church. To learn what his commands are and then to live them out in our lives. Ignorance is bliss. It does not work in the kingdom of God. He says if you obey his work, love for God is truly made complete in you. I, I, I don't, I'm not going to get on a tangent right here, but I, I was studying this right here and I was thinking about the number of people in ministry and the number of times that I have felt this right here, that there's just this distance with God. God, are you really there? And, and I can't help but think about these verses. If you obey his word, love for God is truly made complete in you. Then verse 6. Verse 6 is what it means to follow Jesus. Verse 6 is the thing that we need to wrap our mind around today. To live as Jesus lived. Now, for the literal people in the church, okay, it does not mean that you need to dress in a row and wear sandals and let your hair go all for it's gone and just start walking around and preaching and teaching and whatever. It's not what he's saying. If God puts that on your heart to sell everything, give it to the poor, dress in a robe and sandals, I encourage you to do it. But that's not what he's saying. To live as Jesus did is to have the same priorities that he had when he lived. Like, like, like that's it. What, what, what were Jesus' priorities? I mean, I mean, we know that 12 and younger, it, it was to honor his mother and his father and to grow in wisdom and stature with man and God. We know that that's what it was to be like. And, and then we know that he was all about his father's business. We know that, that in John 17, where, where there's this prayer, where Jesus is staring down the cross in the hours to come, he prays this prayer, and he says, Father, thank you for the work that I have finished. It's John 17, 4. Go check it out. Thank you for the work that I have finished. I have brought you glory on earth. And he hasn't even died for your sins yet, my sins. <clears throat> We know that when, when he started his ministry, his priority was all about his father's business. Let me show them how to live in relationship with one another. And not just funsies. Hey, we're pals. We're budding around. Having a good time. There's nothing wrong with that. We can't stop there. So what was important to Jesus better be what is important to you. Dallas Willard framed it like this. To be a follower of Jesus is to live your life the way he would live your life if he were you. You think about it. Like you, you've, got a, you've got a routine. You've got a plan. A schedule this week. You go to lunch today. Hopefully you take a nap today. You're going to come back to church today. 
you know, wake up tomorrow. Half y'all got like 15 doctor's appointments or whatever coming down this week. The other half of them, you got to go to work. You got all this stuff that you, you got to do. How do you do those things? If Jesus were you, as you interact with people, as you, as you go throughout life, doing the things that you will do this week, how do you do those things if Jesus were you? And, and then it impacts our decision making. I, I'm going to be making plans about next week and the week after. I'm, I'm going to be scheduling things and I'm going to have opportunities to commit to stuff. I've got things for my family that, that, that we'll think through, that we'll commit to. How would Jesus commit to those things? What would Jesus say is important and what's not important? If we're going to embrace this, if we're going to understand what this call to make disciples is all about, then we have to live the way Jesus said. So do you live in him? Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. Father, thank you for today and thank you once again for your word and the examples that have been given to us. You invited every single one of us into a relationship where we get to follow you. God, and in a world where following can be watered down, where it can be convenient, where I can choose not to follow with the click of a button, God, you're not the same. The standard, the expectation, the ask is so much greater. Because it's all about surrender. It's all about denying myself as I make you Lord so that you now dictate the way I live. Father, I pray that we are a church that desires to live our lives the way you lived yours. All the apostles did. They walked away from the everyday normal. They walked away from careers and family so that they could journey with you to become like you. Father, may, may we know today. That as a believer, that this is our most important thing. So I pray for conviction. To live my life this week and into the future the way you would live it. Thank you, God, for hearing us right now.